The anniversaries of the atomic bombings of Japan have recently passed, and they inspired me to examine the question of whether those bombings were justified from the perspective of somebody who believes in selfishness and human flourishing. Now, I'm sure you can see from the image here that I believe they were justified, and those bombings should be celebrated as the most heroic actions of national self-defense in human history. But I'm not asking you to take my word for it. So I'm going to lay out the history of what happened in a way that even people who think the bombings were evil and unjustified would agree with. I've heard Stefan Molyneux, for instance, discuss this issue, and he thinks they were unjustified. I mean, Molyneux is a weasel, but even he would agree with the history as I'm about to lay it out. And I think this is necessary, because whenever you hear somebody defend the bombings, they seem to evade questions important questions that they can't answer. I've watched a PragerU video defending the bombings. It's one of the most popular videos on YouTube regarding the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And like all PragerU videos, it is pathetic and worthless. So I'm going to lay out what happened, and I'm not going to evade any of the so-called hard questions. People like Prager, for instance, they always set up the conflict in terms of it was the bombings or a land invasion, which is not the case many people who are against the bombings make. They say the Japanese had already sued for peace, so we should have just let them surrender. We didn't really have this alternative at all. So I'm not going to leave out any of the facts that people who think the bombings were unjustified think are important. Okay, so what happened? What led up to these bombings? Well, what led up to the conflict with Japan in the first place? Well, let's take a step back. Japan was, historically, an imperial expansionist power. Its emperor claimed the divine right to rule Asia. And so, Japan had a history of war with Russia. And during World War II, and prior to World War II, had been making incursions into China, trying to conquer more and more territory. Now, you are probably aware of the famous Rape of Nanking, an episode of atrocity perpetrated by the Japanese against the Chinese. What is the American relationship to this expansionism, this imperialism by Japan? Well, the U.S., as represented by FDR, did not like this, and had placed sanctions on Japan in the 30s. Now, eventually, as Japan expanded into China, it attempted to place an embargo on goods going into China, which included materials the U.S. was selling to China, war materials the U.S. was selling to China. So Japan was coming into conflict with the U.S.'s trade with another country. Now, in response to this, FDR placed uh, an embargo on scrap iron from the United States to Japan, and later oil. Now, this is important because those are two resources Japan was in desperate need of. Japan also happened to get the vast majority of its supply of those two resources from the United States. I think about 75% of its iron came from the United States, and 80 or 90% of its oil. So when FDR stopped sales of both of these things from the United States to Japan, 
it put the squeeze on Japan. Japan needed these supplies to continue its war. So it considered what it could do to shore up its oil supply. One of those things was to invade uh, territories rich with oil. However, these territories were uh, controlled by the U.S. and it knew that the U.S. would retaliate if it simply invaded and started taking oil. So Japan decided, ultimately, simply to make a preemptive attack against the United States, which was, of course, Pearl Harbor. They thought that perhaps the United States may even simply give in and allow Japan to do what it wanted. Because the U.S. had been reluctant to get into World War II, for good reason, I believe. But they looked and they saw, well, the U.S. doesn't want to get in this war. It's not eager to fight a war. And it's in a depression. So if we attack, they may just let us do what we want. Because all we want is the oil. So they attacked Pearl Harbor. And you know what happened from there. War. So this is the first point somebody like Stefan Molyneux brings up. He says, well, really, it was America's fault. We instigated the war by placing an embargo on Japan, which was an act of war, and they retaliated. Now, I am not one of those people who argues that an embargo is not actually an act of war. It's not violent, it's not blowing things up, but it is a use of force against a foreign country. It is a way of saying, no, we are preventing trade with you, specifically with you, uh, for political reasons. It's an act of force against another country. I think that can only be classified as an act of war. However, there are two things to consider here. First, Japan had already come into conflict with the U.S. by interfering with its trade to China. So you can't say that the U.S. instigated this. Second, even if the U.S. had instigated this, Japan has no right to be free from force from the U.S. Japan was not, this was not an instance of, you know, the American Revolution. This was not an instance of an objectively free country fighting to defend itself. This is an example of a primitive imperial society spreading its particular nonsense through force. Now, the U.S.'s involvement, the embargo on Japan, was not necessarily justified. But if it was unjustified, it was from the perspective of Americans, not the Japanese. It was unjustified because FDR and the government had no right to tell Americans they couldn't sell to whomever they wished. It was not unjustified from the perspective of using force on Japan. Japan, as a less free society, a society that didn't respect individual rights and was in fact violating them and going around conquering places for no good reason, it had no right to say, well, the U.S. can't come in and tell us what to do. Yes, it can. Now, it shouldn't because that puts obligations on its own people that they don't deserve to have. But Japan can't complain. We weren't violating their rights. An unfree country has no claim to sovereignty against a free country. A free country can invade any unfree country at any time, and the unfree country has nothing to say about it. Now, they shouldn't, because free countries should be selfish and fight wars of self-defense, and it's suicidally, immorally generous to go on campaigns of liberation. However, the, the injustices to the people of the free country that are forced to fight for other people's freedom, it's not to the people of that other country. I mean, this is what happened in Korea and Vietnam. The injustice there was not to the Koreans or the Vietnamese, it was to the Americans who were forced to fight on other people's behalf. But the North Vietnamese and the North Koreans, they have no claim to any 
<laughs> rights violations. They have no legitimate grievance against the United States. So the same thing is true here. This whole idea that, well, we forced them into attacking Pearl Harbor because we cut off their supplies of oil. So what? They had no right to oil from us in the first place. They weren't this free country that respected people's rights and we were just being belligerent towards them. No. This was a primitive imperial society that was going around killing people in order to expand its primitivism. Sorry, you don't have the right not to be attacked. Now, it may be the wrong decision to attack you, but it's not wrong because <laughs> you have the right not to be attacked. So that's how conflict with Japan got started. Now we will fast forward through all of the war. Okay, near the end of the war, America has crushed Japan. It is flying bombing raids, conventional bombing raids over Japan. It has been doing so for a long time. The Japanese are refusing to surrender. Then the U.S. finally develops, finishes, completes its atomic bombs. Now, the U.S., through intercepted communications, had reason to think that the Japanese were willing to surrender if the U.S. would but not treat its emperor, Hirohito, as a war criminal. That's what they were concerned about. Now, FDR had demanded unconditional surrender, and Truman had reiterated this when he became president. So, the U.S. was out for unconditional surrender. They were not going to accept this condition. So, given that they were going to pursue the war until they got unconditional surrender, the Americans had a choice. How were they going to get the Japanese to surrender? They could use these atomic bombs... They could continue conventional bombing raids. They could engage in a land invasion. Now, the uh, traditional number for a land invasion was Truman's. He said, basically off the top of his head, that it would cost half a million American lives. Now, this number has been disputed. Some people say it's higher, but even the lowest number I've seen says that probably about 40,000 Americans would have died in a land invasion. And they had already been doing conventional bombing raids for a long time. So Truman decided that he had to use the atomic bombs. He said, if we develop these bombs and the American public finds out that we had these bombs and yet American GIs died on the shores of Japan, there will be hell to pay. So I have to use them as soon as they're ready. And that's what he did. Now, even after bombing Hiroshima, the Japanese refused unconditional surrender. And even after bombing Nagasaki, the Japanese refused unconditional surrender. Why? Well, Japan had a non-aggression pact with the Soviet Union. And they were hoping that the Soviet Union would come in to mediate a peace agreement. However, the Soviet Union declared war on Japan shortly after the second bomb was dropped. At this point, Japan surrendered unconditionally because they no longer had any hope. They had no leverage to get a conditional surrender. Now, after the U.S. got unconditional surrender, it actually let Japan keep its emperor anyway. Douglas MacArthur said he had no desire to denigrate Hirohito in the eyes of the Japanese people. So we let them keep their emperor. Now, that's the history as it actually happened. Now, what are the arguments of the people who say that the bombings were unjustified? Well, the first argument preempts the whole bombings versus land invasion argument. It says, we shouldn't have done either. They were ready to give up if we simply let them keep their emperor. And even if you argue that we should not have let them keep their emperor, we did once we got unconditional surrender anyway. So the bombings were totally unjustified from any perspective, they say. 
Well, here's what's wrong with that. The principle for prosecuting a just war is crush the enemy as quickly as possible with as few deaths on your own side as possible. Unconditional surrender is a moral requirement of any state at war that can achieve it. If you accept conditions, any conditions, if Japan had said the only thing we require for our surrender is for Truman to say the alphabet backwards, no. The long-term self-defense of the U.S. required unconditional surrender. If you allow conditions, what you are saying is, any future aggressor, if you attack us, you are not necessarily risking everything. We may let you sue for peace and let you keep what's most important to you. When you send that message, you are encouraging aggression against yourself. What you have to do is send the message that if somebody attacks you, you will retaliate totally. You will crush your enemy completely. If somebody attacks you, they are putting their future in your hands because you will not stop until you crush them and have the power to dictate their future. When they attack you, they're putting it all on the line. That is the message you have to send. And the only way to send that message is to achieve unconditional surrender. So unconditional surrender is not this pointless uh, point of pride or glory. It is an absolute requirement of justice and practicality. Countries have to know they are risking everything if they attack you. Now, the argument is, okay, but we let them keep their emperor anyway, so the bombings were unjustified. Now, I think we probably should not have let them keep their emperor. But even letting them keep him, even with that, there is all the difference in the world between letting them keep their emperor because they demanded it, versus letting them keep it because we chose to. If we had let them keep it as a condition of surrender, that sends the message that we were willing to give up because they had enough power to threaten us. That we will give up if you can be enough, if you can put up enough of a fight, we might let you keep what you want. You cannot send that message if you want to defend yourself. You have to send the message that we will put up with anything, we will never give in, we will crush you no matter how long it takes. And if we let you keep something, it's because we chose to, not because you had the leverage to demand it. Okay, so, given that unconditional surrender was a requirement, and therefore further prosecution of the war was required, the question becomes, were the atomic bombings justified? Couldn't we have done a land invasion, for instance? Well, as I already said, no. Americans would have died. Case closed, as far as I'm concerned. Now, it's also true more Japanese probably would have died than died in the bombings. But I don't care about that. But if you do care about that, there you go. But you shouldn't care about that. I'll explain why in a second. The other attitude is... Well, why don't we just continue conventional bombings? Why didn't we just continue conventional bombings? Well, we had been doing that, and they weren't surrendering. Now, most of Japan's air defenses had been destroyed, but that doesn't matter. If you can save one American life by using atomic bombs, if you can reduce the risk by 1% to one American life, by using the atomic bombs. You do it, even if that kills everyone in Japan and irradiates that whole island for a thousand years, even if it sinks Japan into the ocean, do it. Because you are fighting for the defense of your people. War is not about this pragmatic balancing of, oh, are we killing more people than we're saving by doing this? No, that is short-term, 
pragmatism. First of all, they're not all the same. The people in Japan were not innocent. They let that kind of leadership get in charge, and even if they were against it, most of them came to passively accept it and support it. So there are very few innocents in war. Now, there are some, but you can't say, well, because there are a few innocent people over there, we have to give up our lives. This whole trend of American soldiers' lives, this whole view that their lives are worth less than foreign civilians, that is totally corrupt, nihilistic, evil. No, the purpose of a state is to defend the people of that state, not to do this pragmatic balancing of the world population. Now further, you save more people in the long run if you fight a principled war anyway. I mean, on every side, you save more people. But the point is, you have to be selfish. You are fighting to defend your life, your values. And if you start saying, well, you know, the bad guys are hiding in this building with a bunch of school children, so we can't bomb them because we would kill more innocent people than we would save. You are acting pragmatically. In the long run, more innocent people are going to be killed that way. You can't look at the short term and weigh the numbers of people being killed. Killing a thousand evil people to save one good person is morally required in a context of war. The good country, the defending country, has every right to kill as many people on the other side as is necessary to defend as few people on its side as may exist. If you start ignoring the nature of the people involved and just look at it as numbers, you know, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, you are going to get an evil world. Because all that's required for evil people to win then is to construct situations where you will end up killing more people by defending yourself than not. Well, <laughs> that will lead quickly to destruction, and it's in fact what's led to where we are right now. Much as I hate FDR, do you think the people of the 40s would have for a second tolerated the reaction of the United States to 9-11? No. As I explained, Truman had to drop those bombs in order to appease public opinion, even if he didn't want to. The outrage from the public that one American soldier would die when he didn't have to would have destroyed him. Was that the attitude during 9-11? No. Is it the attitude today? No. We expect to send our people into the grinder for the benefit of so-called innocent people. Now, even if they are innocent, that's not our job. Our job is to defend us. And it is evil to sacrifice yourself for other people. So, just to get back to the other alternatives. Land invasion? No. Conventional bombing raids? No. Even if it was only a slight increase in risk to Americans. If you have to run multiple people on a bombing raid versus just the one Enola Gay dropping one bomb, you do the one bomb, no matter how long it irradiates Japan. And then there was the idea that you... <laughs> they say we could have... Well, we could have just used the bomb in a non-military way just showed that we had it, showed what destruction it was capable of, and that would have intimidated them into surrendering. No, you do not play around in war and flex your muscles. The fight is on. If you're in a fist fight, you don't then start flexing your muscles and saying, well, do you really want a piece of this? You're already in the fight. You use everything you have to end the war as quickly as possible to get your people out of danger as quickly as possible. We rightly used the bombs just as soon as they were ready. The fact that the Japanese didn't surrender until Russia declared war suggests that even the atomic bombings weren't enough to make them surrender unconditionally. So this whole idea that we could have played around is simply false. We had to use everything necessary to get their unconditional surrender as quickly 
as possible. And despite what people tell you, civilians are a legitimate, deliberate target in war. The war is fought for the people. It's in their name. If you bring the fight to them, you crush the backbone supporting the war effort. You crush the people legitimizing the war effort. This is, for instance, what William T. Sherman did in the Civil War as he burned his way through Georgia. He's one of my heroes, even though I'm a Georgian. He brought the war to civilians, brutally crushed civilians, to destroy the backbone of the Confederate Army. And that was absolutely mandatory and morally justified, morally requisite. War is ugly and it's brutal, and the only moral thing to do is end it as quickly as possible, which requires being as brutal as possible. If you do it halfway, if you do these pinpricks instead of decisive war, you know what you end up with? You end up with what we have today. A decades long, an over a decade long war, a, a welfare war of just constant pinpricks. Well, we don't want to go all the way, so we fight with one hand behind our back and we don't want to kill civilians. How many people have died unnecessarily because we didn't just rip the band-aid off and nuke Tehran? So as sad as circumstances are today, I hope you can take some joy in the fact that things used to be better and can be better. We can have that attitude again. We just need the moral courage to say that our lives come first. We are in the right and our self-defense at the expense of anyone else is a moral obligation we have to ourselves. And we should look for inspiration to the heroic actions of the past most prominently the atomic bombings of Japan, which I am celebrating today, and I hope you will too.